matter since we had a marvelous young man here, a Muslim, who was able to uh, speak out of his own tradition. I don't know, if we, do we have any Buddhists here tonight? We have some practice, I know, but uh, whether we actually call them Buddhists, I guess uh, if Chris, you might be on that. Is it? Oh, we do have some. Oh. Anyway, um, be happy to hear from anybody who knows all about this uh, firsthand uh, tonight. Well, I want to uh, uh, talk a bit uh, about this Christian Buddhist dialogue, and I'm going to use, do it out of my own uh, experience as uh, of uh, doing some dialoguing when I was in Japan uh, this past summer, um, and uh, draw on some of those experiences that I had at that time. There's whole world religion things, and as we've suggested before, for uh, the future of peace in the world. Uh, it's got large uh, implications for uh, how we get along in the future, and we don't need anything more than the peace conference going on right now uh, to remind ourselves of that. Traditions have uh, been a cause of disunity, and have caused a lot of the problems in the history of the world. So the question becomes, can religion become a positive force for peace and harmony instead of a divisive one? And when we look at this uh, Buddhist uh, Christian dialogue, we're going to see things we've been in before, and that is, uh, that is in the Christian West, we haven't known much about it. It wasn't really till the 19th century that, again, that we had good translations of a lot of the Buddhist texts that Western uh, thinkers became much aware of. It was only in the, in the critical biography of the Buddha, so we even knew much about him. Um, and uh, of course now that thing begins to grow and begin to get a more positive attitude about it. And in the Catholic community, I think we've reached an interesting place because in the Second Vatican Council, a kind of statement was made talking about Buddhism, and I quote here, Buddhism realizes the radical insufficiency of this changeable world. So these are Christian people, bishops trying to look at Buddhism that we can agree with sees the radical insufficiency of this changeable world. The world's not an end in itself. It teaches a way by which human beings in a devout and confident spirit acquire the state of perfect liberation or attain by their own efforts or through higher help, an important phrase, supreme illumination. So it begins the other positive things about it here, that these people develop a devout and confident spirit. Yeah. And uh, through their efforts and with the help of higher power, achieve illumination, enlightenment. And as we see, that becomes the key to understanding much of Buddhist thought. And then it goes on to say, if we're talking about other world religions, it says the Catholic Church rejects nothing that is true and holy in these religions. It begins to see Buddhism, therefore, as a vehicle of salvation, as a means of enlightenment, as a means of coming closer to God, and as a positive vehicle of God's grace. Now, the, the, we really have a lot going on in this Christian Buddhist dialogue, uh, as I learned when I was in Japan. Uh, the, in many of the books that are coming out now, I think on the handout that you received, uh, we have some books mentioned here that are carrying on this dialogue now. Now, I would, if people are interested in pursuing this, uh, the two works that are of most interest are number four and number five, where you actually have dialogues uh, occurring between members of what we call the Kyoto School in Japan and uh, important Western thinkers like Hans Kung and others. So anybody who's really serious about all of this, those would be two books to pick up. I have them here, and if uh, people uh, want to look at them at the break or whatever, I'll leave them out. Like uh, the uh, emptying God for one. And then, uh, if people want another way into this J Japan Christian thing, and the way it was this uh, Shusaku Endo, who's written The Life of Christ, and people might have read his novel The Silence, uh, that gives us another entree into all of that. Well, as I go about uh, this, I want to talk about my, my time in Japan uh, and not make it a travel. I don't have my slides with me, unfortunately. <laughs> I, where are the slides? I forgot them. Uh, but uh, anyway, I, I want to use some of that experience. Um, I was uh, there in, the, in that part of the world for a little, about two and a half weeks this summer and uh, made a, 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 an emphasis point on this dialogue with uh, the Buddhists. 
So I did, I did a lot of visiting of Buddhist temples and talked to Buddhist students and had a wonderful dialogue with a Buddhist monk, etc. And it's a lot of that that I want to call on here. Um, so the, the first experience is going to a Buddhist temple in the middle of Tokyo. It's uh, the Sensoji uh, Buddhist temple, and this is dedicated to the god Quan Nong. I have uh, sort of checked out these pronunciations, uh, and uh, uh, they, they're probably close anyway. But um, this temple is uh, based on a, a statue that was found by a couple fishermen back in, in about the 7th century or so of this god Quan Nong, a popular Buddhist god. and. Um, this uh, statue that they found, you know, became a point of devotion, and this uh, temple is built around that, and this statue is actually, no one's seen it for 1,300 years because it's sealed in the altar. Uh, no one could, has looked at it for 1,300 years. We hope it's still there. I mean, I was trying to look inside there and see. Uh, I didn't really uh, come across this statue. But anyway, that uh, is, it becomes a great point of uh, devotion uh, for uh, the people, the Buddhists who come there. Now, when you approach this temple in the middle of Tokyo, um, you go down, it reminds me of something like going to Lourdes, where you have all the selling going on outside the gates of the, of the holy place there. So you walk down this long aisle of shops food being sold and all kind of goods, silk goods and fans and so on and you know sort of uh, boisterous and all of that and then you get into the, the right in the temple area and you see these what appear to me to be really grotesque kind of figures of gods, god of wind and the god of thunder there before you sort of enter more closely into, into the temple area. Off on the side is this beautiful pagoda. I must say the pagodas with their round uh, sort of curved roofs seemed uh, very uh, prayerful kind of things to me. And then, you know, I just sort of wondered about what they were doing. Picking up, and the whole point of this third part is the popular piety. You see, what does this religion mean to people, you know, just the person in the street? Like I suppose someone came up to us walking out of a church and saying, well, what, did you, what are you doing in there? And Why did you go down on one knee or take that water and go like this? I mean, why, what's that all about? So it was at that kind of level that I was pursuing this thing. Well, you see right away when the people are walking in there, they, they go over to this fountain, this flowing fountain on the side. And there's a ladle there, and they take, the, they take the ladle and dip it in the water, and they begin, they sort of pour it over their hands like this. And then uh, they uh, take some to their lips and they pour it, and then some I noticed spit it out, and others then took the water and there was a statue there and sort of threw it up on the statue. So I asked uh, some people, well, what are you doing there? And observed them. Well, in observing them, the first thing you see is that for some people, they're there and they, they have someone take their picture holding the ladle, you know, like this. And uh, there's a sort of a, a light-hearted attitude towards it. And a lot of the younger people seem to be into that. And uh, one wondered if, you know, what that really meant to them. Well, uh, one uh, young woman I talked to says, well, I'm maybe not sure what this is, why I'm doing this, but uh, her parents taught her to do that. Someone else said that, well, what, what's happening is they're being purified. You've got to be purified before you go into the temple area. And that turns out to be one of the classic explanations of what's happening. It has very similar kind of things to the feeling that one gets with the use of holy water, I suppose, and so on. Um, Later on, I mean, I, I did the ritual myself at other temples and uh, tried to get into it. But you, you quickly see that at the popular level, and this is not a put down of Buddhism because you could look at Christianity the same way and see the same thing, but at the popular level you get a lot of people who aren't terribly aware of what they're doing and others for whom it is clearly just a, a pure ritual that doesn't have much to do apparently with deeper sentiments. Then the next thing you see them do is to get some incense on a, on a stick and they take it over in the very middle of that courtyard before the temple and they light this and the incense is then there and it begins, the, the incense rises like this and the people will be standing around are going like this, taking this, the, the incense smoke and, and putting them around. And so again, I want to know, what are you doing that for? What, what's that all about? And uh, it seemed as though that had to do with uh, protecting themselves. From, uh, from evil kind of forces. 
At least that's how some of the people interpret. This was a way of warding off the darker forces that might get in one's way. And um, again, it became a common theme as I would talk to people about why you do certain things. It, it had to do with the fact that there are evil spirits around or evil forces and bad fortune that could come your way and one has to sort of uh, be sure that one wards off that kind of thing. In fact, I was told that the curved roofs of the pagodas are that same sort of notion that to keep away the evil powers in one way or another. Then, when you get closer to where the statue, statue of Quan Non is, is, is in the altar, now we get, you begin to see, they wouldn't let us in there. They didn't even ask. They just said, well, you can't, I think it's just pure, it said foreigners can't go in there. So it sort of locks from the side. People would take their shoes off, as you always do when you go in the temples. And uh, then uh, they would go in, and then I could see them in front of the altar. And some were offering incense, some were uh, in kneeling posture. And, uh, or sort of half sitting posture and were reading from prayer books. Others were doing sort of some chanting and, and so on. Um, one of the other things I forgot to say is that they, they put, um, when they were going into the temple uh, precincts here outside, they would uh, put coins in a box and out of that they would get a, a stick. And the stick would have something wrapped around it, and a number was on it. And then you went and you got that number, you went to a box and pulled out a box, that number, and out of there you got your fortune. Sort of what the future would hold for you. And then they would take that fortune, I'd watch and I'd read it, and then they would sort of tie it up into a, a bow-like thing and place it on different things around uh, the area. Well, that is uh, sort of a one encounter, at least, with um, this, uh, the whole um, you know, popular Buddhism. And uh, you be, one begins to say, well, you know, what do we make of all of this, and, and what would we get out of it, and so on. Now, I think that, uh, just a little sense of history, when, when, when the Buddha taught, I'm going to go into this in more detail later on, but it was a very austere kind of thing. It didn't have anything about gods or Quan on or any of, uh, any of this sort of thing. It, it didn't really have ritual. And all this stuff was a very austere teaching, the Four Noble Truths, as I'll describe them. But um, what it seems to have happened in the history of Buddhism, as it, as it goes along, is that the, the people had a need for something more. And there developed in Japan uh, what we call a particular type of Buddhism, pure land Buddhism. Just like we'd have to say in the Christian world, but we got Orthodox, and we got Roman Catholics, and we got Protestants, and then we got a lot of different kinds of Protestants, Methodists, Presbyterians, and so on. Well, you find the same thing in Buddhism. And it often seems hard to even lump it under one term as you begin to look at it. But what happened uh, back in the medieval period, from our viewpoint, uh, the 12th, 13th century, there developed this pure land type of Buddhism. And it was uh, focused on the figure, the Amida Buddha. And that this Amida Buddha, you see there's, there's the historical figure, Siddhartha Gautama, who lived, you know, died something like maybe 480 BC, although there's a lot of dispute about that. And then you've got, um, he's the historical figure that starts this religion. And, uh, but as you go along, what happens is it seems like it's almost too austere for the common people. And so the common people begin to come up with uh, specific gods and goddesses. That, that guide them and that they have special reverence for. And that's where this Quanon, Quanon comes in. It's typical of, uh, of these kind of figures. This Amida Buddha becomes uh, the special one. It would be not unlike, I suppose, what Catholics have done with Mary very often. When the religion appeared too austere and so on, then religion, uh, Mary became important. You got popular devotions to Mary. She became very important. And you go to Guadalupe in Mexico and see people go up on their knees to the shrine of Mary and people making Mary at the center. It's got that kind of feel. In fact, these figures, when you look at them, they are female type figures. These uh, Amida Buddha statues that one sees. And the, the face gives a sense of compassion and sort of maternal care. One scholar has suggested that it, there is a constant strain in the Japanese character looking for the maternal care. 
and that this uh, this uh, figure uh, rise, you know supplies for some of that. I found it interesting that the original gods that are in Japan go all the way back to the beginning. There, the most important one becomes a, a goddess, the god of the sun. And the god of the sun gives light and compassion and is fighting the other gods, like the god of the wind, that is a, a negative force in the world. So we have uh, all of this uh, sort of devotional kind of thing that goes on. Part of it is this, what they call this practice of nembutsu. In, J in Japanese, they tell me you try to have no accents. You try to, like it's Hiroshima, not Hiroshima, as many of us say, but like Hiroshima. Try to have no accents. Anyway, I haven't quite got that straight yet, but nembutsu. Uh, is, uh, is, and what they, they do is they repeat over, and I call on the name of the Buddha Amida. And it, it part of the devotional practice. And one school of thought says that this is the way, this is salvation. This is the way you're saved. Just concentrate on one thing. You say over and over, I call on the name of Amida Buddha. And that becomes sort of the center. It becomes like a mantra that one repeats over and over. Well, there's a different authors then that had different viewpoints on all of this, of what they would stress uh, saying this prayer. And then other people, scholars come along and they say, well, that's not good enough. You have to, uh, to change this. This is, uh, this is too one-sided. But we want to have more emphasis on the scriptures, what they call the Lotus uh, Sutra, that part of their holy writings. Let's get that straight. And then there comes this figure, I just uh, is a good parallel to Luther in our own tradition. Shinran is his name. He died in 1272, but he's a, he said, now, they had these monks who were all celibate, and he, he got permission from his master to get married. So he said his celibacy is all wrong for monks, so we got to, he took a wife. Not only that, he said, well, all this chanting and stuff, and you're going to bring God's favor, that's no good. Got to get back to grace alone, that God alone will save you, not through merits and not through good things that you do. It's almost a re exact replay of what we have of Luther in the Protestant Reformation in our own tradition. Um, well, uh, what are we going to say about uh, all of that? That popular devotion, in some ways, led to good things. It moved people to live uh, compassionate lives, try to be good people, to get merit, do good things so that Amida Buddha would reward you and you'd get to what they call the pure land. The pure land is like our heaven or like the Muslim uh, final uh, garden where you go and you have delights and good things. It's a very uh, graphic kind of uh, thing. You go to the western world, the pure land, and be rewarded for all of your merits. And part of what this shrine did that I visited then, they had set up uh, uh, schools to teach people. They uh, came up with uh, marriage counseling, social welfare center. They built a hospital, all things in the 20th century, where this Buddhist tradition led them into some sort of good actions in the world. Well, that's uh, sort of my first uh, bit here of uh, this, uh, how this popular religion works and, uh, and the, the way what you get out. You get a lot of magical sense, you get a lot of good fortune ideas, a uh, big thing on getting to heaven and being saved to the pure land and so on. Now, uh, if I can uh, go into the next kind of uh, thing that, that happened here, and that is that uh, I, I sort of, I'm going up the levels here. So now I want to talk about dialoguing with stu college students, then to the level of the monk that I dialogue with, and then to the level of the scholars and how they see it. It's sort of an odd way of approaching this, I guess, but at the end of it, maybe all of that will come together. But uh, while I was in Tokyo, yet, I also had the opportunity for a little dialogue with uh, students at Sophia University. That's the Jesuit school in Japan in one of the maybe four or five best private schools in the in the country the kind of school you go to there to there is absolutely crucial i mean it's not like well if you went to michigan or Ohio state fine or any of the ivy league schools fine or you went to denison or university of toledo or bowling green and you know after a while you get a job and no one cares where you went and so on i suppose unless you're in the academic world but there it's absolutely crucial where you go <laughs> 
and uh, what schools you get into and they're all clearly rated at least in the popular mind and it's that's why you see all this stuff on television where they start training them in kindergarten or at an early age you have to work hard why do you work hard eventually you get into the right school because you get into the right school that's how you get the right job and then you can spend two and a half million dollars to belong to a country club and play golf regularly and so on. I mean, it's all sort of a whole uh, thing that goes on in the culture here. So what school is important? Well, Sophia, Jesuit University, rates up there pretty high uh, in terms of being able to get a job uh, later on and so on. Well, remember uh, one of the young women I was talking to, uh, her English was really terrific and I really, you know, I said after a while I stopped as well, how do you, so good, she said, well, she spent four years living in Florida and uh, went to uh, high school there in Florida before going to the university. And I said, well, you know, in her own home, she had a, a Buddhist shrine in the home uh, that she went to, and uh, they would stand in front of it, bowed heads, and uh, hands folded, offer incense. It was part of her family up. And then I started to ask her, well, you know, is that, what about Buddhism and Shintoism? That Shinto is the more ancient religion in Japan. It's a nature religion. It's connected with what they call the forces Kami, K-A-M-I, which are the, the, the spiritual forces that are working in the world. Us, I guess they'd be almost like gods and often connected with nature and there are Shinto shrines all over Japan. Shinto is, it was the favored religion throughout the history. There are times when Buddhism was more important but by and large the emperors liked Shinto to be in charge of things and it was like, functioned like a state religion on occasion and all kinds of shrines and so on. Um, I also visited those. It's interesting uh, sort of mix but the, the, the point of this is that the, the woman says, well, you can't really tell us. I mean, it's hard to know if you're a Shinto or, or not, or if you're a Buddhist or not. It's all sort of melded together. And then uh, she told me interesting things. She says, well, the common thing for us here is you're born a Shinto, you get married a Christian, and you die a Buddhist. Well, some parts of that made sense to me. To be born a Shinto means it's the culture. Japan is a Shinto culture. It's built in. It's in their love of nature and uh, the feel for nature that they have. You can just sort of sense that in the gardens they have. I want to talk more about that, I guess, later on. But um, then, and to be die a Buddhist makes sense as well because the Shinto priests don't want to have much to do with death and Buddha's really good about suffering and the dark things of life and the Buddhists are really good at taking care of funerals. They go to the people's home, they wash the body and uh, they chant for a long time and uh, the, the Buddhist monk eventually name, gives a name to the person which helps them in the next life in terms of being reincarnated and so on. It gives people confidence that they're well taken care of in their next life. So the Buddhists are terrific at funerals. But then, what is this Christian marriage thing, you know? And they say, and, and I listen to subways and the trains, you see all these advertisements for weddings. And the, the young women are not in kimonos, but they are in Western wedding dresses. And all these ads for weddings. And so they are talking to a group of young women, oh yeah, that's, we all want to be married Christian, be married in a Western Christian ceremony. That becomes very important to us. And I said, well, the priests and ministers won't do that, will they? They don't really, and they said, oh yeah, sure. Well, I really didn't believe them. I mean, I thought, what is a priest going to take the Buddhists? And, well, I, was, I talked to the married old missionaries. That's why I was over there to lecture to the married old missionaries and uh, try to update them theologically a bit. And as always happens, I obviously learned more than I taught them. But uh, they said, oh yeah, we could be doing those all day, every day. People that come to us constantly. And it's one of our few points of contact with the people. No, Christianity just can't make it in Japan. Let about 1% of the population is Christian. Less than 0.5% is, uh, is uh, Catholic. There's more Protestants than Catholics. But uh, there's no openness. There's no entree. The whole uh, culture is closed out against this foreign influence. Uh, it, it's, it's an amazingly closed culture. One of the things that really struck me was that when they import a word from the outside world into their language, it is written in a different script. 
So forever after, you always know when you encounter this word, reading that it's a foreign import. I mean, it says something about, you know, this closed character. Well, so what the priests do is they take these weddings. In fact, you know, there was a hotel across where the Marinolers lived, the New Atani Hotel. <laughs> And in there, they built a chapel for weddings. They could have weddings going on there all day long. In fact, they tried to hire the priest just to come over and do the weddings. So uh, they, they do these sort of uh, constantly. Or, or they try. I guess the priest, I'd say rather this, the priests are sort of selective. And they try to get people who might have some openness. They use it as a chance to say something about Christianity. Some of them do. Others use it as an opportunity to uh, just try to help them psychologically, counseling-wise, to prepare them for marriage. So, um, in talking with these, uh, with the uh, with the students there, then the you know, thing and you know, what all of this means to them and, and so on. Well, they begin to to have a different sense. These more sophisticated students. If I ask them, "Well, do you believe in all these gods that I encountered at the shrine there and so on?" and their answer is, is something like, "Well, I don't really think so." I don't, I don't, I'm really sure if I believe in God or, or not, but I, I surely don't believe in all that stuff you're telling me about, you know, that average people going to the shrine would believe. Now, we begin to get a other level of sophistication, I guess, in all of this, uh, where the, they see it, again, uh, as a way of keeping themselves sort of on track, as a way of uh, finding some strength, a way of getting some enlightenment about life and so on. That's how the religion seems to function for them. And uh, one of the young women said, well, you know, this Buddhism you're talking about here has changed an awful lot from the way the Buddha taught it in originally. So you begin to get, uh, again, a more enlightened sense. Something that, as I suggested last week, I hope in a, in a uh, kind manner, you don't see this among Muslim students. It's a very different feeling. The Muslim students are, have not passed through that critical kind of sense. They're almost uh, uh, incapable in a way of being critical of their religious tradition. The Buddhist students weren't like that. Very open and ready to criticize these particular developments that they didn't think accorded with what uh, the Buddha really was all about. Well, what am I? What are we going to say about uh, all of this uh, in terms of you know how we might respond to this? Well, the first thing is that for sure the Buddhists uh, help us to make sure we're ready to face the dark side of life. You no, know, we live in a death-denying culture. A lot of times we're not ready to deal with aging. We want to pretend we're younger than we are. All of these kinds of things. Uh, the the troubled character of human life very often people want to just pass over it we have to have a more optimistic outlook if we happen to be sad someday and walking around people are going well don't be sad you know um i haven't thought of a time like that well sad being sad is a perfectly human emotion i mean you know why can't one be sad it's all part of being human but we live in a culture where it's almost not allowed to be sad or to be talked about uh, death and so on. Well, in an encounter with the Buddhists, one gets a di very different feel. One of their primary notions is that life is suffering. Life is dark and hard. And uh, one has to figure out how to cope with that. So it's an almost like an invitation to us to look more within, to be more in touch with uh, the darker side of life and uh, to face death and uh, the other uh, mysterious things of life that might end up bothering us. Also, I think it, it represents a, an invitation for us in the West to sort of, uh, in our own minds, uh, to begin to think critically about our own popular practices. I mean, I do find it a little disturbing at times. I mean, I'll talk to students who are interested in the church, and they'll start, they're going with a Catholic, and they come to Mass, and so on, and, well, the Catholic person isn't able to say. They say, well, why do you do this? I don't know. Oh, we just do it. You know, or go into a Catholic church, why do you put your hand like this and go like this? I mean, there's a, you know, one begins to sense, well, it would be good if uh, we had developed a little more uh, education on this, I guess, or understood the tradition, or understand why we uh, do uh, particular things that we do. 
Also, I mean, I think it's a good uh, way to remember that um, very often there's a wisdom in the popular religion that we don't want to get away from. The Latin uh, American liberation theologians found this out. They did a lot of speculation about the Gospels, Jesus the liberator, and so on. And then the next phase of the development of liberation theology was to look at the popular religion. Look at the way people actually lived it out. And very often the theologians, when they did that, felt that they found real wisdom in there, good insights that at first blush might want to have just uh, tossed off like that's meaningless, those people don't know what they're doing, or whatever. Um. <laughs> it really has speeded up. <laughs> Uh, let me uh, say something now about um, a, a sort of a next encounter. I, I could just go briefly. One of the other things I said was go to Shinto shrines. I might just uh, say something, and I'm hard pressed to actually interpret this. Um, uh, the, the major shrine is the, the Meiji shrine. Um, it was built, I think, finished in 1930 and then bombed during the war and um, after the war was reconstructed. I mean, it is a massive kind of thing. And they try to build these Shinto shrines in beautiful wooded areas usually and surround them by beautiful things. Um, and this is a massive place. I, mean, it's, I, I don't know the size of it. I mean, it's just immense. Uh, and uh, uh, finally, finding my way to the, the, to the shrine uh, area itself, um, I, I observed a ceremony. And that I, afterwards, someone tried to explain it to me. But there was a father. It was in an open area where the people behind could watch. And a lot of people understood it, did watch. And periodically, they would go like that and say some sort of a chant. But there was a father there with three children, and there were three ministers. I found it interesting, one was a woman. And they would come up to them and do various rites over them, like the woman would come up with bells, and in front of each, and ring the bells in front of them on all sides of them. And then they had other um, ceremonial things that they would come up and, and do in front of the, the, the people. And uh, then there was this gigantic gong, at the back, and the one very large fellow who had this uh, tremendous mallet and would hit this gong uh, periodically, and it was just, I mean, it had a, geez, a striking effect. I mean, it, uh, you know, I guess, you know, calling down the gods in a way. Um, and then later on I was told that, that in all likelihood what was happening is that the, the man's wife had probably died recently, and he was there seeking help uh, to deal with that and with his family and getting the blessing of the, of the Shinto uh, liturgical people here to uh, try to help them to, to deal with it in one way or another. Uh, the Shinto shrines and the Buddhist temples go closely together. I was at one monastery where the, it was a Buddhist temple, but right on the grounds, the next one was a Shinto shrine, and I said, well, do you have a Shinto priest here to take care of that? And they said, no, the Buddhist priest takes care of it. He, takes, he does the Shinto ceremonies. So uh, the, the two become tightly woven together and it's almost hard to distinguish them, I suppose, in one's mind. But uh, the Shinto uh, thing is, is closely allied with nature and has very many different kind of gods and goddesses and, as I say, probably grew up in a matriarchal culture at one time, something that becomes totally lost in Japan now where women... Um, you know, really uh, do, are not treated all that well. I mean, uh, women are often excluded and expected to do everything for the men and uh, uh, often don't have the kind of privileges, although I did find out that there is a women's liberation movement in Japan. There was a group that had 25,000 members and they were protesting uh, pornographic playing cards that men were using and there was a game, card game, and, and it was very demeaning to women uh, and even the, the phrases used in the game and so on and these, these uh, women's liberation movement was uh, protesting that. But uh, it, by and large in the culture, I mean, it's, uh, women uh, do not uh, uh, do real well. I mean, they're, they're expected to uh, attend to the men and uh, uh, so on. 
uh, without so many rights, although I presume it's like a lot of other cultures where the women have secret power within the family structure and know how to deal with the children and, and have uh, that kind of influence. Now, that brings me to uh, the next sort of dialogue here that um, I want to uh, talk about, and that is um, uh, where I, I then went uh, from Tokyo and I went to those bullet trains, the Shinkansen as they call it. I mean, those things move. <laughs> I mean, there you get a feel for technology. You, 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 the train leaves at 9.30, it leaves exactly at 9.30. Um, I had to leave on the train at 7 o'clock from Tokyo. That timing was the worst possible timing. Because that afternoon, I was at the World Track and Field events. And uh, tickets were extremely expensive, and I couldn't really afford to go there to get a ticket. But I went there, and I found these three young Americans who had just flown over the, from the United States for the World Track and Field, and they had an extra ticket for me, which was uh, very nice, And because uh, one of their friends couldn't come. So I go in there, and it's the afternoon that Carl Lewis is running and doing the 100-meter the uh, heats, and... You know, there's all kind of excitement about that and so on. And, uh, and then uh, he was going to run the most famous hundred in all of history that evening at 7 o'clock. And uh, at that point, I told the young three young guys who had flown all the way around the world to be there that I had to leave. <laughs> <laughs> to get on a train to go to Kyoto. <laughs> Uh, they were incredulous. They, uh, I think they're still talking about it. You won't believe it, but this guy missed the most famous hundred in the world. He walked right out of the track meet in the middle of it. So anyway, I got on a train because I had to go and do this lecturing in Kyoto, which is the cultural center of Japan. And uh, where all the temples are, it was not bombed during the war, so you have all kind of uh, things there. And especially in Kyoto, you have Mount Hiei. Up on Mount Hiei is where back in about the 7th century or so they established a monastery. And at one time they had 30,000 monks in this monastery. Buddhist monks up on the top of a hill or a mountain. In fact, they had to take a cable car to get up there. And uh, I mean, it was just a, you know, an impressive sight. You can look out over Kyoto and Lake Biwa, which is a, the biggest lake in Japan. It was just an amazing kind of thing. Well, uh, when I got up there, uh, we, we toured the grounds, uh, well, part of the grounds, as you can imagine, it's vast, and uh, saw the major temple, and uh, there uh, they had burning in front of the major uh, statue of the Buddha, uh, three lights that they had kept burning now, I think, for 1,200 years. Uh, as, as, as sort of, you know, continuing devotional items to, to the Buddha. And then we saw a monk in there who was uh, doing petitions. It reminded me of what I saw at uh, Zagorsk in outside of Moscow where the Orthodox uh, faithful came in and would ask the priest, the Orthodox priest, they'd hand him a, le a note saying, please pray for me uh, with this. And then the monk would chant that petition and say some prayers. Well, it was just like that. In other words, the monk was there and he had these petitions that people had given him to pray for, and he was chanting them. And all the while, he, he's, he's stirring this fire. He's lighting this fire and, and stirring it all in a very ritualized, careful way. I mean, you can see that was sort of his life work to tend this fire and to say these prayers for these uh, people uh, that had asked him to do that. Well, after that, uh, uh, I went uh, then to a dialogue with uh, one of the Buddhist monks. And uh, going in there, you take your shoes off and were given other slippers to wear and ushered into a room with a low table, it's, I guess like we see in the movies and so on, and the tea was brought out and so on, and we sat there, I, there was a, a Marino priest interpreting for me, and uh, the Buddhist monk came in, and so uh, we spent about an hour, um, and mostly in my trying to uh, understand what he was all about, and, and what his tradition was, and so on. Well, the, the first thing that I, I did was I, I asked him about uh, meditation, which is the key to their thing, and how he did it, and so on. Immediately as his face lights up and he starts into animated explanation of this, he stands up and he gets down and he shows me. 
ought to be solid there. You know? And then he gets down on the ground and he shows me on his knees, on his elbows, and his forehead on the ground. You know? So that the, he begins to tell me how important posture is. You know, it reminds me of the stories when the, the monks, when they're uh, meditating, they have one who walks down behind with a big stick. And as they're sitting there meditating, he comes up and he whacks them on the back like this. And if your posture is right, it doesn't bother you. You know, you <laughs> absorb this. And uh, if your posture is wrong, this is, uh, is, it doesn't feel too good. You <laughs> shape up in a hurry. Uh, rigorous discipline. Here. So he gets down, he's telling me all about uh, all of this. Uh, and then he tells me about the importance, not only of posture, but the importance of breathing. And being conscious of your breath. And really uh, being conscious of, of all your bodily reactions as you're meditating. I want to detail this a little bit later on because I think it's uh, helpful to all of us and something we can learn. But the importance of the breath, but he does not use a mantra. He doesn't say a prayer as he lets his breath out. He's just conscious of his breath. Then he told me about the great problem with distractions. When you pray, you get distracted, meditate. And he said, and, and out of great serenity, well, that's what I guess impressed me about him. He was very disciplined, very serene fellow. Just exactly what you usually imagine a Buddhist monk to be. Just extremely calm and quiet and self-possessed, etc. And out of that, you know, he says, don't worry about distractions. You know, don't fight distractions. If you try to fight them, they'll be worse. Just be gentle with yourself. Just go with it. Again, I think uh, excellent advice in all of our prayer life. Then the importance of the regimen. So what kind of regimen? He got up at 5 o'clock in the morning and with the other monks did group meditation. That was a part of it. And then throughout the day there were periods of study and meditation and walking around the grounds. And then in the evening again there was another time for uh, group meditation. And the way they prepared for this, and as they had done now for centuries, back since the 7th century, or around when it was founded, is they have a novitiate that lasts 92 days. And for the 92 days, you sit. You sit in uh, the meditating posture, the lotus position. And uh, you, you sleep like that. Uh, they bring you food in. Now I presume that sometimes you have to get up out of this posture. <laughs> However, he never admitted to that. <laughs> but he's in this posture that 92 days and doing this meditating and this preparing and uh, uh, so on. Uh, all part of the discipline. And many times I said, well, do you ever, do people ever repeat this? He said, well, the, the training time for the monk in there is 15 years to prepare to, to really become a, a monk. Now other people come and prepare for just two or three years and then maybe go out and live the life of a lay person. But the monks um, live in this, uh, uh, you know, this long period of preparation. Then he told me about one member of the monastery who had repeated the 92-day ritual 10 times in his life. So um, it gets to back to some of these things you read about the Christian monks in the East who knelt for 10 years on rocks uh, to sort of prepare themselves for living out the Christian life. Then I asked him about some of the uh, scholars who, uh, in Kyoto, there's a, there's a Kyoto school of Buddhist scholarship, and it's founded by Nishida at the turn of the century, so I asked him about them, and now he became quite negative. Well, these, these scholars, it was like, it was sort of an anti-intellectualism that came out. Well, these scholars, they don't know what they're talking about. I mean, they're, they're not practitioners. They're too open to Western ideas. So he didn't have much use for the, the scholarly world of Buddhism, right, you know, ne his next door neighbors there. Then, he's animated about all this stuff. Then you, and this is so typical of what happens over there. Then you ask him, well, who are you meditating to? Or, or I tried a hundred different ways to ask this question. I mean, well, what are you doing when you're meditating? Or who are you directing your prayers towards? Or do you believe in God? Or do you think there's some sort of ultimate being that we relate to? The face just becomes blank. It's like, what? It's like a Martian arrived and asked about something no one ever heard of. It's just total blankness, like, what? What's the question? 
I mean, he couldn't get the question, no matter how I would ask it. And it's all part, of course, of the great refusal they have uh, built into their very bones about any of the metaphysical questions. And here the monk was being uh, true to the teaching of the Buddha. The famous uh, uh, story of the Buddha is that if somebody shot you with an arrow and you're lying there on the ground, you do not ask yourself, who shot the arrow? Why did they shoot it? What angle did it come in on? What you want to do is get the arrow out and stop the bleeding. And that's the Buddha's story for how you should deal with the ultimate questions. Is there a God? Is there an afterlife? Is what's nirvana all about? All of those things are non-questions. They get in the way. They keep you from achieving enlightenment that you're supposedly after here. So, this is, um, you know, it's just a, an absolute refusal to deal on the part of the monk to deal with those kind of questions. Is there a God or not is a non-question and it's dangerous, I would say dangerous, to try to answer that. This will move you into speculation and move you away from your meditation and your serene spirit, calmness that you've been working all these years to try to achieve. Now, it was interesting that at this very monastery, and we often think of the Buddhists, therefore, as quietists, as stepping back from life, and so on. Well, this monk was involved in a couple different dialogues. One, there are a lot in that area, there are a lot of Christian Buddhist dialogues on the question of the environment, how the two religious groups can overcome the pollution problems in Japan. And the Buddhists are very interested in that, and they come at it out of a great sense of nature, part of the Shinto heritage, I think, that they've uh, taken on. Well, because you'd have to explain this, because Buddhists, first of all, think that this flux of a world that we live in is, as they call it, samsara, which means it's just all not, it's not that good. Buddhism is a world-denying religion denies uh, the world, it denies the, even sort of the reality of the world in a sense, it's not the ultimate reality, it's all suffering.